thank you everyone uh, uh, in Mitochon for inviting me to speak this morning. Um, it's a tricky title you've given me, can we predict MILAS? So well, hopefully um, we'll get to an answer at the end of my talk as to whether we can or, or cannot predict MILAS. So um, just a little bit of a historical perspective first on, on MILAS and, and what MILAS means is myopathy, encephalo, uh, encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes. Um, and the first clinical report of this came around in 1984. Um, and you will note that there was a certain Salvatore uh, de Moro uh, uh, in uh, this initial publication. So I believe it was there right at the very beginning in terms of the clinical description of MILAS. But it wasn't until 1990 that the first genetic mutation associated with MILAS was described uh, by Goto et al. in, in Japan. And then uh, Michio took up the, the baton uh, again in New York with Billy's input um, to uh, identify a case with a genetic mutation and describe the diagnostic criteria. And the diagnostic criteria for MILAS were essentially that a stroke-like episode occurs before the age of 40, that there is encephalopathy characterized by seizures, dementia, or both, and that there is the presence of lactic acidosis, ragged red fibers, or both. So MILAS <clears throat> is largely caused by mutations in mitochondrial tRNA leucine one particularly a position 3243, where there's an A to G transition. It's a disease of heteroplasmy rather than homoplasmy. There are a few cases reported of homoplasmy for this particular variant, but by and large, this is a disease of heteroplasmy. The A to G transition affects a position in the D stem, uh, uh, sorry, in the D loop of the mitochondrial tRNA leucine, UUR. This transition accounts for about 80% of MILAS cases. But the precise mechanism by which it's causing a problem is, is uh, yet to be hallucinated. There have been reports of it affecting the amino acylation of this mitochondrial tRNA, um, but also hypermodification of this wobble position uh, uridine, and that affecting codon anticodon recognition. There are, however, more than 30 different pathogenic mitochondrial DNA variants linked to the MILAS phenotype, and a number of those also occur within this mitochondrial tRNA leucine. So how common is this variant? Um, well, some work by um, Manwaring uh, under the guidance of Carolyn Sue in the um, Blue Mountains in Australia identified a prevalence of around 236 per 100,000 population. Hannah Elliott and Patrick Chinnery, looking at the Cumbrian birth cohort in England, um, identified a prevalence of 140 uh, uh, patients, uh, sorry, mutations in 100,000 of the population. So that put the prevalence somewhere in the region of one in 400 to one in 700. So that's a lot of people carrying the 3243A to G variant. Um, and clearly the disease prevalence is nowhere near that. It's some 40 to 70 times lower. So why would that be? Well, perhaps we will see the answer to that question as I, as I go on through this talk. But what I'd like to do, first of all, is really give you the breadth of disease that's been associated with 3243 and the sort of phenotypic variability that we see. And there's no better example, I think, than, than this family here. Um, Dennis was a patient of mine for quite a number of years, and he had a full gamut of disease with very severe encephalopathy, eventually uh, seizures uh, and stroke-like episodes. And perhaps not surprisingly, he had a very high level of the 3243 A to G identified in his muscle. His mother, uh, also pictured here, had uh, some 40% of the 3243 in muscle. Um, and she had uh, diabetes initially and, and subsequently developed some deafness. His sister, pictured between them, uh, we couldn't identify the 3243 at all in any of the tissues that we obtained from her. And we looked very hard in um, hair, buckle, blood, and urine, and couldn't see this variant at all. But the family do illustrate this variance in the 
uh, phenotype that presents. And maternally inherited diabetes and deafness is recognized as a syndrome associated with 3243, as is chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, albeit that it's less common than the single deletions. Um, interestingly, some work by uh, Victoria Nesbitt when she worked here in, in Newcastle um, showed that over half of the patients who are symptomatic and carry this 3243A to G uh, variant do not present with a syndromic classification. So some of the other features that patients with 3243 uh, can develop, well, they can develop a severe bowel dysmotility. You can see on the x-ray here that this um, bowel is loaded with, with feces. Um, when that dysmotility gets to the stage where it's affecting the small bowel and large bowel, there's the possibility of bowel obstruction and indeed a chronic or acute intestinal pseudo obstruction. The scan here on the uh, right of the screen is an MRI scan of the abdomen and you can see fluid levels in the stomach and large intestine. As Thomas has just been alluding to, uh, lots of mitochondrial uh, variants cause disease that is multi-systemic, and some of it is, in fact, constitutional. Um, so this is James and his mother, um, and James has the 3243 variant, and his stature was, was short, like many of our patients with 3243. And we looked at this a little bit more systematically and identified that, that actually they are really very short uh, compared to uh, the general population, but even compared to other patients with single deletion uh, and nucleogenetic disorders, all of whom are shorter than, they, than would be expected from the population. And what's interesting about this growth um, uh, and stature is that these children are actually short at birth and remain so throughout their life. Um, what changes with time is their uh, BMI, so their muscle mass and weight decreases as they get older. And I mentioned the chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia phenotype. Uh, I've just shown this slide to perhaps indicate that actually the ptosis associated with CPO, uh, you will appreciate it's very difficult to show CPO in a, in a slide, um, but the ptosis associated with it is somewhat milder. So the two gentlemen on the left of the screen are 3243, and I think the ptosis is slightly uh, less obvious than perhaps with patients who have single deletion or indeed multiple deletions. As part of this multi-systemic uh, involvement of disease. Uh, we also see um, uh, presentations that are sometimes unexpected. So these two individuals, you will see the, the history here looks very similar in that they uh, were in their early 30s, both in full-time employment, um, engaged in regular uh, physical exercise. They were on a night out with their friends, uh, one of them consumed a small amount of alcohol, the other didn't have any alcohol, but they were both found dead the next morning. Um, we had seen them in clinic previously and, and, and measured the uh, heteroplasmy levels, and they were noted to be 30% in blood and around 70% in, in urine. There was no history of epilepsy, and their ECGs that were performed routinely were normal. Uh, one of them indeed had a 24-hour Holter monitoring uh, as part of a clinical trial, uh, and that was felt to be normal. Echocardiogram was mildly abnormal uh, in the lady who uh, is presented with mild LVH, but nothing that warranted intervention at that stage. We had access to cardiac tissue post-mortem, however, um, and indeed muscle and brain tissue. And in fact, uh, the histology show here shows a lot of blue fibers. And the levels of mutation were much, much higher in the ventricle, in, the, the, uh, in the, both ventricles in the gentleman, at around 91 uh, and 95%, much higher in muscle as well at 85%, and brain tissue 90%. The same is true for the, uh, the lady presented in that the muscle was much higher at 90% and brain at 85%. And, Whilst it's convenient to take blood and urine uh, levels, 
It sometimes doesn't tell us the whole picture. Okay, so the, the question I was asked was, can we predict MILAS? And I think we have to just have a little think about what MILAS is and what the stroke-like episodes are. I've shown here a fairly typical appearance in that the occipital, so this is an MRI scan with involvement in the occipital lobe, in the temporal lobe, and in the parietal lobe. And what makes that stand out to neurologists is that that involvement of those three lobes, lobes extends beyond the vascular territory of one blood vessel. Sometimes the stroke-like episode is a bit more subtle. Uh, this is an individual who has had multiple stroke-like episodes in the past. And those of you who are neurologists will know that the brain looks pretty atrophied. In fact, those of you who aren't neurologists could look at that and tell me that that brain is pretty atrophied. Um, the stroke like it was a little bit more subtle in this individual in that it's confined to this very small area. So how do those stroke like episodes evolve? Well, we had the opportunity to follow this in a 26 year old um, and they had a scan seven days into the presentation or post uh, initial symptoms. And you can see here involvement of the, the temporal lobe at day seven. Day 14, that area has expanded to involve almost the entire temporal lobe on the right. By 30, day 32, things seem to be resolving a little. I'm a bit concerned about this area here. and There may have been some atrophy around uh, the right lateral ventricle. Subsequently, involvement of the corpus callosum and more obviously involvement of the left temporal lobe in day 183. And then almost just over six months out, and you can see again um, further involvement of this temporal parietal occipital lobe on the left uh, with some residual changes on the right, so symmetrical changes. And what sorts of features are associated with this stroke-like episode? Well, uh, we've had a look at uh, a number of patients with, with MILAS, um, 14 patients encompassing over 100 episodes. And of those episodes, 92% had headache at the start of their stroke-like episode, and another 92% had seizure. And um, positive visual symptoms were also present. Um, in those individuals. Uh, and that speaks to a little bit to the um, differentiation from migraine and, and stroke-like episodes. So Ian G, Grunia Gorman uh, and Roger Whittaker had the opportunity to look at EEGs associated with those stroke-like episodes and I actually were able to review uh, 98 of those EEGs and they frequently captured electrographic seizures. Um, these electrographic seizures were mainly confined to the primary visual cortex, but had a propensity to generalization, typical polyspike and wave with, as I said, generalized bursts. Um, and that's focus in the occipital cortex may well explain a lot of those um, symptoms, particularly in relation to positive visual symptoms and making those type of reactions. So these, focal, uh, these seizures can be very focal with subsequent generalization, but sometimes they remain focal and initially can be remarkably subtle. And uh, I'll just show an example here again on uh, this patient, James, when he's a little bit older. And you can see the subtle movements of his thumb. And he is aware that that's happening, but remains conscious throughout. And you will see as it spreads, it becomes a little bit more exaggerated. He's getting more rhythmic type jerky now involving that left arm. And he's actually able to, to speak at this point. But you feel okay, do you? Uh, yeah. Yeah? It just moves about. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? 
So I, I mentioned earlier the intestinal pseudo obstruction, uh, and it seems that episodes of IPO are more frequently associated with stroke-like episodes, um, complicating 57% of episodes uh, in 14 patients that Dr. Ng was able to, to look at. Um, the other associated features uh, were uh, an association with cardiomyopathy um, and a change in urine heteroplasmy by 10% uh, was also, so higher levels of heteroplasmy were also associated with that. Um, that risk is just, is just shown here in a couple of Meyer type um, uh, graph and illustrates that with increasing age and stroke-like episodes, the possibility of remaining IPO free decreased dramatically. And interestingly, being underweight also uh, decreased that risk of being IPO free. Okay. okay, so this is another of our patients. This is, this is Neil, uh, who is pictured here initially uh, at the age of 33, shortly after his first presentation with a stroke-like episode. And again at 52, just a year before his death. And um, whilst we can all have a, an off day in terms of having a photograph taken, just ask Michelangelo, um, that you will agree with me that the 19 years between these two photographs has not been kind to, to Neil. So Neil, um, as I said, presented initially with a stroke-like episode. He subsequently developed diabetes became deaf, developed cardiomyopathy, had gastrointestinal dysfunction, and eventually cognitive decline uh, to dementia and recurrent episodes of intestinal pseudo-obstruction. As I said, died at the age of 53. Um, his brain is shown on the MRI scans in the middle. And at post-mortem, his brain weighed 800 grams, and it was more compatible with that of a, uh, a patient who had Alzheimer's. You can see extensive atrophy uh, in his brain. And we've had the opportunity to look, uh, Nicola Lax has uh, looked at this neuropathologically, and uh, we've had the opportunity to look at post-mortem brains in several patients with 3243. And what's particularly striking is an area of the, the cerebellum, uh, which is showing uh, extensive atrophy. This is a control um, cerebellum, and these are patients with 3243, and I think even macroscopically you can see uh, the, the degree of atrophy there at a molecular uh, level. We can see here the granular layer. These big fat chunky cells are Purkinje cells. They're very ATP dependent. They're completely absent in the 3243 brain, you can see. Okay, so there are lots of clinical features associated with uh, 3243 disease. Um, Stroke-like episode in our patient group was probably in the region, affected probably in the region of 20%. Um, Michelangelo has published uh, from the Italian cohort, and absolutely agreement that there is an extensive range of phenotypes associated with 3243. Um, the precise uh, frequencies is, is slightly different in the Italian group than it is in the UK, but nevertheless, um, there are similarities too. So how are we going to sort out what factors determine the clinical phenotype and answer the question? Well, we took inspiration from some, from some work we've done in a, in a more straightforward disease um, that associated with large-scale single deletions. Um, all four of these individuals have uh, large-scale single deletion, but have very different outcomes in terms of the clinical disease they were affected with and, uh, and indeed their uh, lifespan. We went to our cohort of patients, which currently includes about 1,855 patients, um, and we looked at NMDAS data. NMDAS, uh, I probably don't need to explain in a great deal of detail. It's safe to say that it's a means of systematically recording disease impact. Uh, it, it looks at um, both patient reported and uh, doctor identified problems. And over the years, we've managed to accumulate a lot of patient data, uh, having first applied these scales back in 2008. John Grady, uh, who's a postdoc in uh, our lab, looked at the um, uh, patient cohort of large-scale single deletion 
and their NMDAS scores, as well as heteroplasmy uh, and the size of the deletion, and came up with very clear correlation between the deletion size and the level of heteroplasmy. Um, the raw data for that looks, uh, uh, is shown here and, and, and looks a little bit difficult to follow. Um, the variance on it is uh, still somewhat large, but, but you can see here that those with um, large-scale, large deletions at high levels of heteroplasmy progress more rapidly. Their NMDAS score is higher earlier on. And those with smaller deletions and low-level heteroplasmy um, are surviving with a low NMDAS score into the 50s, 60s, and 70s and beyond. So how can we apply though that kind of thinking to 3243 with its host of um, multi-system involvement and, and, and very uh, different uh, clinical outcomes? So John again was involved, as was Sarah Pickett, um, in looking at the cohort of patients with 3243. Uh, and this comprised 242 patients. And they were able to look at blood, urine, and muscle DNA samples from various proportions of those 242 patients. And one of the, thing, the first things that, that they were able to confirm was that the blood heteroplasmy declined with age, as has been recognized previously. Um, Sarah was able to do was, was provide a, an age-adjusted blood heteroplasmy calculation, uh, which we applied to that cohort. And I like to refer to this graph as my Jackson Pollock graph. Uh, you can see that um, there's a lot of information on here. The single dots uh, are individual NMDAS scores. Uh, when we have those series, serially for the same patient, they are linked by a solid bar. The heteroplasmy uh, is recorded in color, so that red is high level heteroplasmy, yellow is intermediate, and bluey green is low level. And you can see here that all of these patients in red are presenting uh, uh, with high level heteroplasmy and are presenting with high NMDAS scores at a young age. Similarly, um, those with low levels of heteroplasmy uh, or have low NMDAS scores are presenting uh, or, or surviving into older age. In contrast to the Jackson Pollock, this is the, the David Hockney of graphs. Um, this is looking at muscle heteroplasmy and combining it with copy number. Uh, Thomas and Valerio know uh, about copy number in, in lawn, uh, but it's also important in other mitochondrial DNA-related diseases. Heteroplasmy here, again, uh, red is, uh, is high level, uh, and copy number uh, is shown by various uh, dashed lines. So this solid high-level heteroplasmy is associated with low mitochondrial DNA copy number uh, and high in MDAS. Uh, score. The dashed uh, blue line here is high copy number and low heteroplasmy. Low NM does survival into old age. So in summary, um, the findings of that study were that um, males have a higher copy number uh, in their urine uh, and we needed to, uh, and heteroplasmy, uh, and so we needed to add 20% to that. The age adjusted Heteroplas blood heteroplasmy correlated best with disease burden and progression. Um, in skeletal muscle, age, heteroplasmy, and copy number uh, explain a much higher proportion of the variability in disease burden. But even there, the R squared was only 0.4. So only 40% of the variability in phenotype was explained by age, heteroplasmy, and copy number, the things that we can easily measure. So we published that, but then had a bit more of a think about this. And I say we, I mean, Sarah had a bit more of a think about this and how we might look at the heritability of factors. Um, we had, and others have noticed in the past that, that sometimes there are congregations of particular clinical features within families and kindreds. So how do we explain the fact that only 40% of the variance in the phenotype uh, is related to those age heteroplasmy? Uh, and uh, um, copy number variants. Other nuclear factors must be contributing. So again, we looked at 238 of the 32438 carriers of the cohort, and um, 
more than 234. Those had over um, more than one NNDAS score uh, with multiple 40. And we modeled the risk factors for specific phenotypic features. And you will see that there are some features uh, that we might expect, so uh, an association with each other, encephalopathy is strongly associated with stroke-like episode, seizures are uh, strongly associated with encephalopathy. There are some clinical features which were observed which don't seem to have any strong correlation with the, the other features. So psychiatric involvement, depression and anxiety and schizophrenia have no clear correlation with many of the other uh, features of 3243. And there were some unexpected ones. Uh, so a myopathy has a very strong association with cerebellar ataxia. And this graph is really just showing that there were a, a number of um, clinical features that had a very strong uh, nuclear genetic component to their expression or heritability. Um, and those were uh, psychiatric involvement, cerebellar ataxia, migraine and cognition. The psychiatric involvement was really the strongest with a heritability factor of 0.76. But as I've said, cognition, ataxia, migraine, and hearing impairment were also associated. We published that work, um, but identified the fact that we need a large scale genetic linkage and association studies to really confirm what is essentially preliminary work. I'll just touch on um, some work that's also come out of, of Italy, and this is slightly different looking at biomarkers. Um, Anu gave a very good talk yesterday on, on this, um, and particularly in FGF21 and GDF15. Um, but the group in Italy, given that this is an Italian meeting, and I'm asked to talk about MILAS, noted that FGF21 was significantly more elevated uh, in um, um, the MILAS group compared with controls, and, likely, uh, and likewise GDF15. They also had the opportunity to look at circulating cell-free mitochondrial DNA. Um, and identified again that this was more commonly elevated in MILAS. And they had some preliminary results um, uh, looking at individual patients that they were able to follow longitudinally and measure this cell, uh, circulating cell free mitochondrial DNA as a biomarker. I think they would agree too that it would be helpful to look at this in uh, 324, other 3243 phenotypes and look at a larger study. So, in conclusion, I think that. Um, can we predict MILAS? Well, we can certainly predict some of MILAS, but we cannot predict it all. And I think we are making strides towards being better able to understand this disease and the influence of nuclear genetic factors in its expression. But what we're going to need to do is to combine our efforts across the world, looking at much larger cohorts of patients uh, with disease associated with the M.3243 A to G mutation. And I'm going to finish there. Thank you.